Hello. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yep. All right, cool. Yeah, let's get started. So welcome to um, our tutorial. So today we'll be talking about um, uh, how to use Glow NLP to build modern neural network models. Um, so as deep learning become increasingly important in natural language processing, we have seen that the different tasks and fields are starting to share more components uh, than ever before. And the field is also more focused on models and approaches that work for multiple tasks and cross fields. Um, so as a result, for researchers and developers, it's much more important to build on top of existing frameworks to bootstrap and um, do fast prototyping. So um, today we will try to provide a hands-on experience in building neural network models through this library called GoNLP. And throughout the sessions, you'll be able to um, use Jupyter note Notebooks to practice uh, model development with us. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so we will cover how to reproduce prior state-of-the-art results, fast prototyping, and large-scale models, and also for people who are from industry, at the end, so at the end of the tutorial in the afternoon, we also have a session for deployment in the product environment. Okay, so we expect that you should already know some basic knowledge in deep learning, like uh, word embeddings, recurrent neural networks, convolution neural networks, and all. Uh, we will have a brief introduction for the more recent models like transformers, but we would expect that you already know the, the basics. And, um, and also, all of the practice and the um, hands-on sessions will be done uh, in Python, so we expect that you can program in Python um, comfortably, and also uh, you can use NumPy, Jupyter Notebooks, and so on. <laughs> All right, um, so for, to set up the Jupyter Notebooks, can um, everyone who is interested in hands-on session now just send an email to the address shown here, emlp19-d2l at request-notebook at mxnet.io. So once you send, like any email, it's fine. Once you send the email, you will get a confirmation uh, immediately. Uh, with the title, your noble request is accepted. And then in 10 minutes, you will, so it takes 10 minutes for the, the remote machine to uh, get started. And then you will get another notification email uh, about the, that the notebook is in service. So you'll be able to access all the notebooks we will use in today's tutorial uh, through the link in the email. Okay, so I will show this slide again uh, at the end of this part. All right, um, so before we get into the hands-on, the more interesting part, I also want to talk a little bit about the uh, motivations of why uh, we built this library. So since the revolution of deep learning, there has been several paradigm shifts in the research community. Uh, and the most prominent one is the data. So six years ago, around 2013, um, so if we count the number of papers with the word data set in the title, um, there are only fewer than 10 papers. Um, but starting um, from that time, there is an exponential increase in the number of papers that are focused on building new data sets. Um, and in particular, this year we have seen almost 60 papers whose main contribution is the new data set. Uh, so this shows that um, uh, compared to before, where most of the research is done on Pantry Bank, people are much more interested and willing to build new data sets to study uh, phenomena that does not exist in current data sets and also drive new research directions. And also uh, such work is um, valued and rewarded more uh, in the community. So in addition uh, to the data set, the number of new data sets and tasks, we also see increasing, uh, we also see increase, increasing data set sizes. So taking reading comprehension, for example, 
around 2013, uh, we have the MC test, which is the uh, multiple choice rating comprehension data set. So the, in that data set, there are only uh, less than 1,000 question answering pairs. And then a few years later, there's another data set coming from Microsoft Research, but, but again, the total number of examples are less than 1,000. But then starting uh, in 2016, we've all of the uh, rating comprehension data sets are, uh, have um, at least a million examples. And most recent, the natural question has over three million, million examples in it. So what are the uh, implications of these changes? The first is that now for each task, we have a lot more benchmarks to run. Uh, we can test our models in different domains from different aspects. And also, uh, the exciting thing is that there are a growing number of new tasks to work on. Um, and this requires us to run the model on multiple data sets, so we would like to have a framework that can deal with heterogeneous data formats. So specifically, we want flexible data pipeline to load, manipulate, uh, and batch examples. Okay, so that's, that will be the first um, part that we'll focus on, how to, have a, how to use a flexible data pipeline in Guan We will cover that in the next session. So the second change uh, in the field is that now the majority of problems are taking this deep learning approach. So you see that there is, a, uh, again, a exponential increase in number of uh, papers using uh, neural network or deep learning approaches. So before, uh, if you work in machine translation, you use a completely different pipeline uh, compared to, you know, for someone that works in summarization. But nowadays, most generation tasks are using the sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. And similarly for natural language understanding, now the trend is that we will build one model that can solve many different tasks like uh, fine-tuning with BERT. So we see this converging trend that um, the same or similar models and pipelines are being used for many different tasks and data sets. Um, so we would like to have a composable, composable mod, uh, neural network modules and training pipelines so that we can easily uh, change our model for different tasks. And the common pipeline here is that once we get the raw data, we convert that into a vector space and then have a classifier on top of that where uh, the vector space is using Im either embeddings learned from scratch or pre-trained embeddings like uh, BERT or other large-scale language models. So here the desired features are uh, pre-processing and batching pipeline, plug and play embedders, and also uh, core modules like recurrent, convolutional, and self-attention networks that we can compose together to build new models. Okay, the final important change in the NLP community is that the amount of compute needed um, has grown uh, really fast over, over the past several years. So here um, I have the figure from uh, OpenAI. In, so from 2013 when we have uh, AlexNet to 2019 when we have the AlphaGo Zero, um, the, the, the compute has increased 30, 300,000 times. Uh, it's not just because of uh, the training data sites keeps increasing. It also, now that for each task we have more data sets, it means we need to run more baselines, uh, more experiments, and also the hyperparameter search adds to the amount of compute we need. Uh, and here is one extreme example. So in one paper submitted to iClear this year, uh, titled Large Scale Pre-Training for Neural Machine Translation, they explicitly mentioned uh, in the paper that they can only finish two epochs upon submission, uh, which has already been running for three months. So of course, this is a very extreme example, but it demonstrates how um, the require for uh, large scale compute are already limiting the, the type of research we can do. So um, the third desired feature for, uh, for a good deep learning framework is uh, to handle large-scale training, such as data, easy data or model parallel um, across multiple GPU machines and also distributed optimization. So we'll also touch upon that a little bit in the, in the afternoon. Okay, so here is our uh, roadmap for, for the following sessions. So first we'll have um, a 
warm up session uh, to get familiar with data pre processing, uh, modeling, and training pipeline in Guan NLP. And after that, we will have a more involved session where we will look at how to build a machine translation system in a low resource setting, which doesn't work out of box using existing models. And then we'll see how we can fix or tune some hyperparameters to, uh, to improve the model. Um, and then in the afternoon, uh, we'll look at this, uh, we'll have a brief overview of the large-scale pre-trained language model, specifically uh, the progress in BERT. And then we'll have a hands-on session on develop a question and answer model based on BERT and uh, doing some improvements around that. Um, and then in the last part, we'll talk about how to do large-scale training and deployment in a product environment. Okay, any questions? Cool. Um, so before we start in the hands-on session for people who come in late, I'll just repeat our setup procedure. Uh, so it's pretty simple. Just send an email to um, the address in red, emlp19-d2l at request-mb.mxnet.io. And then you will get a confirmation email after 10 minutes, once the notebook machine is set up, you will got another email um, with a URL that you can use to access the notebooks. All right, so um, let us know if you have any questions accessing the notebooks. So we'll start the next, so the next session will be um, uh, basic data pre-processing pre uh, training pipeline in Google NLP. Hello, everyone. Um, so uh, my name is Sean. I'm uh, an applying scientist at uh, Amazon AI. And um, I'm going to cover the, the basics um, session uh, to get people up to speed down um, you know, the tools that we're using so that we can enjoy more the, the later sessions. And also, during the, the training, um, if you have any question, just raise your hand. Um, so our tutors in the uh, front row would be able to walk up to you and help. Okay, so um, how many of you have already got the, the notebook, um, the, the replied link? Okay, um, I guess we, we need to wait a little bit for, for everyone to, to have the um, notebook. So... Um, Basically, if you uh, send an email to emlp19-d2l uh, at request notebook.mxnet.io, you'll be uh, getting a confirmation email first, and then uh, a bit later you would receive the link to the notebook. So it would look something like this. Um, and here's the link to mine. I'll hide that. Okay. Um, so. Um, in the, the first part of um, today's training, um, the, we're going to the 01 basics uh, folder, um, and we will cover three notebooks. Um, in the first one, we would be covering uh, word embedding. So like I already mentioned, um, in deep learning for uh, NLP, it's really about um, the data and the representing it in the way that neural networks can understand. Um, and uh, Word embedding and word vectors are really the first piece of progress uh, that made a big impact uh, in this area. Um, so in that notebook, we will cover how we can get the embeddings easily uh, in Google NLP. We have over 700 uh, pre-trained embeddings available uh, with one click. And um, with that, uh, we will also cover a bit on how to use the mass library in MXNet. Um, so you'll be able to uh, do different manipulation on that. Um, so in the second notebook, we would cover the modular design of the data pipelines because um, unlike uh, image classification, the NLP pipeline uh, for data is usually a lot more complex. So um, we would need to uh, do lots of transformations such as uh, tokenization. Sometimes we need to lemmatize. Um, and uh, um, after tokenizing, we we'll need to convert it into uh, the index and map it to embedding and all. So um, we'll cover all of that in the second notebook. 
Uh, and in the third one, we would put uh, everything together into an example. Uh, we're going to do um, the uh, very traditional uh, sentiment analysis task for NLP. Um, we'll be using the first the continuous bag of words method uh, to uh, classify uh, the, the movie reviews. Um, and then you would have uh, a chance to exercise and implement the bidirectional uh, RSTM based model. Uh, and see the enhancement yourself. Um, so now, how many of you still haven't got the notebooks? Okay, uh, did you at least get uh, the confirmation, the first confirmation? I didn't get the email. You haven't received any reply? I just, I just, I just the yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, sure. Um, it's um, this email address. So I'll wait 10 more seconds to make sure everyone has the email address and send uh, an arbitrary email to it. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, if you've already registered to have the badge, um, it's on the back side of your badge. All right. So. Um, I guess I'll uh, get started, and whenever you receive the, the notebook link, you can just jump in and follow along. All right? So uh, let's get started on the, the word embedding notebook. Okay, I'll be presenting it like this. Um, the view is um, different. Um, um, so, yeah, I'll... I'll um, I think I'll, I'll continue here, and um, um, so for people who uh, received the the link later, they can still follow along the uh, the, the later notebooks. So um, I'll be presenting in this view. Um, it's basically the same content as uh, the notebook that you have. Um, so you can just follow along uh, as I do, and uh, later on. Uh, Towards the um, end of um, each section, you would see the exercise block. So I'll pause there and give you some time to do the hands-on practice. All right? Okay. So, um, like I said, this uh, first notebook is about uh, manipulating word embeddings. Um, so in order to do that, we need to uh, get the ND array in MXNet as well as uh, Gluon LP. So this will be importing them. Um, so in Gluon LP, we have uh, an embedding module uh, where all the pre-trained word embeddings uh, are accessible through a, a single command like um, embedding.create. So I have an example here for fast text trained down English Wikipedia. Um, so I'll run through here. So um, the, the source here, fast text, means that uh, all the embeddings that are returned from the, the list sources method uh, would be uh, from the, the fast text pre-trained embeddings. So uh, this would make your uh, modeling and results comparable to other people's work. <coughs> So here, um, when I run the embedding.create, it's going to do two things. One is automatically downloading the embedding. And because I already ran it before, uh, I already finished downloading, uh, on your side, you would be able to see that uh, it has an in-progress downloading uh, message. Uh, and after that, it's going to load that into uh, the memory of the machine. Okay, so... Um, Word embedding is uh, um, uh, consists of um, vector. Um, we use a fixed length vector to represent a token. So that's uh, a one sentence summary of what word embedding is about. Um, so uh, with a vector, 
uh, we can do uh, all sorts of analysis. Uh, for example, we want to uh, start simple and uh, try to do the word similarity. So uh, this is about finding the, the word that's uh, most similar, uh, that's the closest uh, in the uh, embedding space. Um, so um, here, in order to uh, deal with the, uh, the problem of um, potentially having vectors that are in the same direction but have a different norm, uh, we have this simple function of normalizing uh, the uh, embedding. So uh, once we have the normalized uh, embeddings, we can uh, do a nearest neighbor um, on the uh, embedding vectors. Say that I input a word uh, into the, the embedding and it returns the embedding um, of that word. Um, I can um, normalize the, the vector um, and then use, uh, here I use the dot product to um, get the, the distance between the two embeddings. Um, so uh, the, um, the vocab vex uh, variable here represents the normalized uh, word embedding of all the words in the uh, pre-trained embedding vocabulary. And um, uh, doing the dot product would have the effect of uh, evaluating the similarity of um, uh, all these uh, embeddings with the desired word. Um, and with that, uh, that distance, I can do a top K um, to find those that are uh, the closest to uh, what I need. And I can find uh, the indices of these words that I, um, I, I just calculated from the top K. And um, in the embedding, uh, I have the reverse lookup uh, from the, the index to the token. So this would return me the, the tokens um, that I, I need for, for this. Okay, so um, now that we have the k nearest neighbor based uh, function for getting the similar words, um, we can try to look up uh, the embedding uh, the top five uh, most similar words uh, with uh, the word baby. Um, the re reason here is that uh, the person, the team member who wrote this function uh, was having a, a, a new baby around the time the code was developed. So we kept that uh, example around. Um, so yeah, here we can see quickly that the results come out. Um, and here we have words babies, newborn, baby, mom, uh, toddler. So uh, when I say this is uh, word similarity, I actually lied a bit um, because um, this really comes to how the, the word embedding is generated. Um, so um, here uh, the, uh, the fast text embedding is actually trained uh, using a method called the skipgram, which is uh, going, uh, which is um, basically modeling the similarity of a word's context. So this is how we uh, sort of measure uh, how the, the words are similar to each other. So when we say that uh, one word is similar to each other in this sense, uh, it's about having a similar context. Um, so that is why mom uh, appears a lot in the same context as uh, baby. So uh, we can also measure the cosine similarity directly uh, of these um, two words. So 0.76. Cosine similarity ranges from zero and one, so. Um, now uh, we can move on to doing something more interesting, uh, which is uh, word analogy. So, um, here, uh, the word analogy is about uh, the analogical relationship uh, between pairs of words. So uh, what we're doing is quite similar to the similarity, except that uh, we're actually uh, measuring the similarity uh, in the difference of the word vectors now. So um, we... Uh, subtract the, the first word from the second word's embedding and then plus the third word. Um, so this is the, the vector that we're trying to measure the, the similarity with now. 
Um, and the rest, uh, I, I think I've already explained. Um, so here we're getting an example, um, the top one uh, analog analogical word uh, to the word pair uh, man women uh, with that word son. So uh, man to women is what uh, science to doctor. Um, so now it's uh, exercise time. Um, I think we'll uh, spend five minutes here. Um, uh, I would like you to try in your own notebook um, a couple of uh, other examples on, say, similarity and uh, analogy and see if they make sense. And also you would be able to get a sense of, um, you know, what I meant uh, when I say uh, the similarity in, in word vectors is about the similarity of their context. Um, so uh, you also have all these um, uh, exercise description in your notebook, so you'll be able to find them in a cell. Um, so, uh, and also um, in the, the part uh, just now, um, so uh, I described just now, uh, I used the fast text embedding. Um, you can also switch to, to Glove, which is using a, a different method of generating the embedding. It's based on the global statistics uh, of the word frequencies. So uh, you can try out that and uh, see the effect yourself. Uh, you can compare. Uh, the results uh, using the word pairs that you pick and uh, see how different they are between fast text, English embedding, and uh, uh, glove embedding. Um, and finally, um, so if you've been following the news, you've probably heard about biases in uh, word embedding. So I would like you to get a hands-on sense of uh, what these biases are. Uh, so the challenge here is that I would like you to uh, describe the, the type of bias that you're looking for and uh, give out the uh, pairs of words, uh, analogical uh, pairs of words uh, that you found that does have this bias. All right, so uh, let's get started. Uh, for those who still don't have uh, the notebook uh, and haven't received any confirmation email yet, uh, please raise your hand. Okay, um, so do you all know uh, where to, okay, I'll, I'll show that um, email address again. So um, for those who just came in, uh, please write an arbitrary email to uh, this email address, emlp19-d2l uh, at requestmb.mxnl.io. Um, you would get two emails. Uh, first one would be a confirmation that we received your request. Um, and the other is the uh, actual notebook instance uh, that's sponsored by uh, Amazon SageMaker. Sorry? Oh, yeah. Sure, okay. Yeah, yeah. So just to make sure that everyone has the capacity, I think we can extend the, the exercise time here a little bit. Um, so uh, let's try to find as many uh, biases in the word embedding as possible.
So our tutor, Leonard, there is walking around in the room. Uh, if you need any help, just raise your hand. Um, is there anyone who has problem connecting to the Wi-Fi? Uh, I think there are a couple over there. Oh, and also for this setup, um, if you have a cell phone that has a working cellular connection, it would work on your phone. The SageMaker notebook would work on your phone. So when creating the uh, embedding, it's actually automatically downloading uh, over 10 gigs of um, data. So it could take some time. Um, if you uh, found yourself stuck on that cell, don't be alarmed. Okay, has anyone found any biases yet? No? Okay, we'll, we'll take some more time.
for those of you who just joined us, um, you can write an email to the uh, the most prominent email address here, um, and it would automatically create a SageMaker notebook instance for you. So that's uh, an instance with the Jupyter notebook running uh, on top of a one a V100 GPU instance. Okay, do we have any successful uh, embedding BIOS Hunter? Hey, we, we have one. So what did you get? Ah, okay. Uh, what, what's the output from that? Oh, okay. So that's a gender bias in uh, the embedding. Good job. Okay. Actually, got something very different. <laughs> it's all different versions of tokenized uh, occupation. Ah, okay. A different embedding. I see. Okay. So I guess this means the fast text embedding is slightly more robust. So again, for those who just joined, uh, you can write an email, an arbitrary email to this email address to get your own GPU instance. So what's gonna happen is uh, you would get two emails from uh, that email address. The first one is uh, that we accepted your uh, request for the instance and uh, once the instance is ready, you would receive the link to that uh, notebook instance. Any more biases? Or is the, the fast text embedding taking too long to download? You found one? Go ahead. Oh, okay. So you said man, manager, women, or? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I, I found this here, too. Uh, manager slash assistant. Okay, it's uh, another gender bias. So I wonder what would happen if, say, I do um, Chinese copyright. Let's say American. Oh, okay. No, no problem here. 
Um, yeah, I remember having some uh, weird results from one of the embeddings. Pr probably not uh, from the fast text. Okay, any more ideas? Go ahead. Dog and cat? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I actually find the actor in the top five analogy in this pair. Yeah, go ahead. Uh huh. France, Paris, and China. Let's see. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think some of the results are, so China here is a bit weird. Um, Shanghai, Beijing, and Guangzhou, uh, I think they're all the, the biggest cities in, in China, so. But the capital is not the first. All right, uh, has uh, everyone received the uh, notebook instance yet? Is there anyone who still hasn't uh, got the, the instance? Okay, so um, which stage are you at? Okay. Okay, yeah, it should take uh, less than 10 minutes to receive it. All right, given the time, I think uh, I'll move on and uh, introduce the, the data pipeline part because the fun part uh, is later when we can play with uh, a sentiment analysis model, all right? So uh, let's move on and build on top of this. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, what we can do for building data pipelines for NLP. So uh, in this notebook, we're building the data pipeline for uh, the IMDb movie reviews data set. Um, so in that data set, we have uh, the text, which is the review, and also a score uh, from one to 10. Um, so that's the rating uh, on that movie. Um, so we'll simplify this problem as a binary classification. We'll take the lower range as a negative sentiment and the higher range as the positive one. So in this notebook, we will learn how to uh, numericalize the text, which is basically to use integer identities to represent each of the token in, uh, in text. And uh, after that, uh, we need to learn how to uh, deal with efficient batching for um, the, the text data. So this is really because of uh, the nature of the hardware that we have. So say for a GPU, um, when you launch the, the same computation for many jobs, uh, it actually runs in parallel and uh, it's quite efficient to process. Um, so that means uh, processing in, uh, in batch would be desirable and we want to apply the same to, to text. Um, on the other hand, for text, there's uh, a bit of variance in the nature of the data, which is um, that the, the movie reviews, for example, they're all varying in length. Uh, we'll see how uh, variable it would be uh, in, on the data set later. Um, so in order to process it efficiently, we want to try to put the, the samples that are similar in length to each other so that we can process them efficiently. 
Um, and uh, finally, I'll introduce the, um, the, the abstraction in Luan and uh, see how we can put it uh, cleanly together. So uh, let's get started. Um, so on the data pipeline side, we will cover uh, these concepts, uh, the data set abstraction in Gluon, um, and also the transform functions, so the ways of uh, transforming uh, the data set into the desired uh, format. Um, and also I'll introduce how to use vocabulary and numericalize the, the text tokens. Um, on the uh, efficient uh, batching side, uh, we introduce uh, the batchify function, which is about uh, how we can get the uh, several samples together and form a, a batch out of it. Um, and also I'll introduce how we can use a bucketing sampler uh, to efficiently process the, the data. So sometimes um, you would have the support for variable length input on some typical model. For example, uh, in the QDNN library, uh, there is support for variable length input uh, for RSTM, uh, GRU, and vanilla RNN. Um, but this is not uh, a general case that applies to every model. So say that you want to develop something new, uh, like a new attention model, chances are that uh, you don't have the built-in support for ragged tensor. So, um, so that means um, uh, in that case, it will be more efficient and uh, it, it will be more general to apply the bucketing strategy in order to get efficiency out of it. Um, and finally, with uh, these, we can put together into a data loader um, that we can efficiently process uh, and go through the data. Okay, so here we're using IMDB data set, um, and uh, in order to do that, let's first do the ritualistic import. And um, so the data pipeline in, in Gluon starts with the data set. Uh, it's a very simple abstraction uh, you can see here in this class. Um, so uh, this is uh, pretty much the, the same data structure as say a list in uh, Python. So you can uh, get an item from the data set based on its index. You know the, the length of the data set up front. And uh, here the addition as a data set uh, in terms of functionality is the transform function. So you would be able to pass a function to it uh, on how to process each of the item and you can convert that into uh, some other form that you want. Uh, I'll show example later. So uh, here, uh, the lazy switch is uh, something for caching the results of the output. Say that uh, your function here for transformation is uh, deterministic. It means that you can do it once and don't have to repeatedly do it. So you can just cache it uh, by saying lazy equals false. Okay, so uh, in Gluon LP, we have uh, many built-in data sets. Um, so in the later part of the notebook, you would see links to the API docs uh, where we link all the public benchmark data sets. So this would allow you to efficiently try out new ideas in many different areas. So um, here I got the training and test data set for uh, IMDB and I'm printing the first sample out of um, the IMDB data set. So remember that data set is just like a list so I can get the first example uh, by indexing it. And uh, the format of each of the built-in data set is documented on the API doc. Um, and in this case, it's uh, uh, two fields. One is text and the other is the score. So we have here a review on the, the Bromwell High. And the score is uh, pretty preferable. Um, so now uh, we are going to try to transform the, the data set into something that we want. Um, so uh, we want to here tokenize the text uh, into a list of tokens so that I can map it into the, the index. Um, so the index would be something that we can use for looking up embedding like we did in the last notebook. 
So um, here I define the transform function to be on the, the input sample. I unpack the, the sentence and the score and I'm simply splitting on the white spaces uh, in the text uh, to tokenize it. Um, so in a more general case, you probably need uh, some uh, other functionality like existing tokenizers from other libraries. You can all plug, in, uh, plug them into here. Um, you can use spacey tokenizer, you can use NLTK. Um, if you want, you can use uh, the Stanford library for this as well. Um, so um, here I'm calling the data set the transform function and passing the function. Um, so if I now get the transformed data set, uh, the, the first item out of it, uh, you would see that the first sentence is now tokenized. I'm showing the first 20 tokens. Um, so we also have uh, plenty of built-in transform functions in Golang LP. Um, here we have one that's uh, commonly used, which is to clip the, the sequence lengths. Um, sometimes the, the text could be super long. You would have, say, thousands of uh, tokens. Um, and uh, for practicality, you might want to just keep the, say, first 500 of, out of it. So for such uh, common functionality, we uh, design and uh, implement the API so that you can repeatedly use the same. And it would also make your program readable. So here, um, the, the first sample was of length 140 tokens. And after calling the clip, uh, it's only keeping the first 20 out of it. Um, so now let's move on to uh, vocabulary and numericalizing the data set. Um, so uh, a vocabulary is basically a mapping from the token, the, the string, to uh, its index, integer index. And that integer in index can uh, correspond to a vector in the uh, embedding uh, matrix. So um, we are going to use the nlp.vocab class here. Um, so here in the first cell, I'm showing how you can construct such a, a vocabulary from your own uh, data set. So remember that uh, from the last transformation, I have the tokenized uh, list of tokens and the score as the two fields in the new data set, the transform data set. Um, so I'm now using the iter tools to chain these um, tokens together into a, it, an iterable stream of uh, all the tokens. And with that, I can pass it into the count tokens to generate a counter of um, the unique tokens from the data set. The reason that we want to do this is that sometimes we want to keep only the, the tokens that appear often enough. Say that there is a, a typo that only appears once. It might be better to just pretend that it's uh, unknown to us. And um, by modeling unknown this way, uh, the model can be more robust to, to deal with some uh, rare or typo cases and all. So uh, once we have the token counts, which is uh, the output from the count tokens, uh, it would become a dictionary that maps from the token to its uh, frequency in the stream of tokens. So uh, with that counter, we can uh, pass it into the constructor of vocabulary and uh, specify that we only keep the tokens that appear more than 10 times in this stream. So uh, by printing the vocabulary, you can get the statistics uh, on the size as well as um, the, the special tokens that are reserved in this vocabulary. And also I'm here uh, printing the first 10 uh, indices in the vocabulary. Um, so in this vocabulary, we're keeping uh, special tokens like unknown, uh, padding, beginning of sentence, and uh, end of sentence. Okay, so uh, once we have that, uh, we can actually pass the list of tokens to the vocabulary and it, it would automatically map it into uh, a list of uh, integers that correspond to that token. So here we see that uh, Broomwell uh, has the token zero, which actually corresponds to 
uh, the, the unknown token here. So this is uh, an example of a word that didn't appear often enough. So we're treating it as unknown. So yeah, for the special tokens, uh, we're uh, leaving the uh, index zero to the unknown token and for padding, we're using the index one. So uh, we'll use padding because um, we want to batch the, the samples that are of different lengths. Um, so uh, that means for the shorter samples, we would need to pad towards the end of it. Now uh, let, uh, we got to the first exercise in this notebook. Um, so this is about implementing the transform function uh, according to the, the requirement here. So uh, like I mentioned at the beginning of this notebook, uh, we want to treat this uh, sentiment analysis problem as binary classification. So first of all, we want to uh, convert the scores to uh, the binary label uh, for this task. And also here I provided a length clip 500 um, function. So this is to keep the sequence length shorter than uh, 500. So you can use that function in your uh, transform function here um, and uh, keep the length at uh, maximum 500. And finally, uh, I've already shown how we can use the, the vocabulary to numericalize the tokens. So here, please do the same. Uh, and uh, once you complete this function, uh, you'll be able to run the next cell and uh, print out the, uh, the indices of the token as well as the, the binary label. So uh, once you got that, then it means that uh, we got this working. All right, so um, let's get started. Um, so uh, is there anyone who still hasn't received the, the notebook instance? Or is there anyone who don't know what I just talked about? Okay, so um, I'll, I'll just uh, do, uh, I'll just show the email address again. So for today's training session, we are providing the uh, V100 GPU backed uh, notebook instances. So uh, the way that you can get the notebook is by writing an arbitrary email to um, the, this email address and our system would automatically create an instance for you and reply to you the link to your notebook instance. <clears throat> so an arbitrary email would be fine. Uh, you don't have to be applied or anything. But later on we might add that feature. If you have any question, just raise your hand. Uh, our tutor would look up to you and uh, help you with that. Okay, have we finished uh, the function? Anyone still working on that? Okay, so I'll start typing and finishing the, the function here.
Okay, so once you finish, you should be able to see something similar to mine here. Okay, so uh, in this function, we're first converting the, the score that's greater than five to the label. Um, so uh, larger than five means it's uh, positive and uh, otherwise it's negative. And uh, for uh, the tokens, we use the length clear 500 function from above and uh, it would keep the first 500 tokens for each of the samples. And um, uh, we already constructed the IMDB vocabulary from before, so we can just use that to uh, look up the indices uh, from the, the sample. So this is how this function could be implemented. And running it would uh, generate the, the indices of the tokens as well as the, the label here at the end. And with that uh, transform function, uh, we can now do uh, the data set transform on the tokens and score um, and generate the actual training and test data set. So here I'm doing lazy equals false, which means that it would actually transform the data set and cache the result. So that's the output that you would get from this. Okay, so uh, now that we have this, it means that we can numericalize the data uh, into the format that uh, a neural network can understand. Um, so in order to pass it on to GPU for processing, we need to batchify this into an uh, array-like uh, kind of structure. So for each of the batch, it has the same uh, height and width, basically. So um, let's first uh, examine the data set and we can see here that in this uh, data set, um, the lengths of um, the, the tokens uh, vary from 10 to 500 with a standard deviation of uh, 128.51. So it's a quite variable kind of data set. Um, regardless, so um, we can now uh, try to form the padded batches from this. So in the first cell here, uh, we're trying to pad all the, the samples to uh, the, the same length. So um, first we get the padding value uh, from the vocabulary. This is corresponds to uh, that number one that I showed in the vocabulary. So uh, index one is reserved for padding tokens. Um, so uh, in GLONLP, we have built-in uh, padding function for batchifying. So uh, what this function does is that uh, for uh, the samples that we pass on to uh, the data loader, it would try to pad all the, the samples to the longest sequence that's in that batch. So that way we can form a, an array-like uh, kind of structure. So here, um, we get the training token indices and uh, we can try to uh, see the effect of uh, say 10 samples by, by doing this. So here I'm getting 10 samples from uh, the data set and I'm calling the pad tokens batchify function on it. And you can see that every sample is padded to the 436. So uh, 436 is uh, the maximum lengths of uh, the sample in that batch. And uh, for uh, the label on the other hand, uh, since it's just a single number, uh, we just need to stack them all together uh, and it would become a vector of uh, the labels. So um, in our data set, the second uh, field is the label. So I'm using this get second to get the labels uh, from this. And we can try to call the stack labels, uh, the stack batchify function uh, similarly. So we can see that it becomes a, a vector of length 10. And finally, um, 
so um, in a data set, we have more than one field, and we want to uh, process and uh, batchify them differently, uh, just like we showed here. So for tokens, we want to pad, and for labels, we want to stack. How do you express that in, um, in a uniform way? So um, we provide the tuple uh, function for batchify, and uh, you just need to pass in the pad tokens uh, batchify function and stack labels batchify function to um, corresponding to the two fields, and it would batchify the data set uh, accordingly. So for all the first fields, it would uh, pad, and uh, for all the second, it would just stack them together. Yeah, so this is how the batchify function works in uh, one LP. Um, on the other hand, uh, what we achieved just now uh, is uh, this. So we have a data set of uh, variable lengths, and um, the lengths are not sorted in any way. So um, for the adjacent samples, uh, we can often get uh, wasted computation. Say for this batch, uh, all the other samples are not uh, varying that much, but there's one sample that's varying a lot. So that causes the, the large gray area here. So almost half of the computation would be wasted on the, the padded area. So how do we uh, deal with this? So this would be the, uh, an ideal way of uh, dealing with such variable uh, input case. Um, so say that we, we put all the, the samples of uh, similar lengths to, into the same bucket, and uh, when random sam uh, sampling from that bucket, all the samples are pretty much of the same length already, so the padding area would be greatly reduced. So in the last example, we have uh, average padding to be 11.7. But uh, in the, the bucketed uh, case, uh, we have only 1.8, so almost uh, an order of magnitude reduction on wasted computation. So in GluonLP, it's actually quite easy to express this. Um, all we need is uh, the length statistics from the, the data set. So we already showed that how you can get the length of each sample from uh, the transformed data set. Um, and you can pass that into the fixed bucket sampler. Um, so you can tell it that uh, you want to uh, batchify them into batch size 64. Um, so uh, a bit of uh, black magic here. Uh, because of the architecture, oftentimes on a GPU, if you use a batch size of multiple of 32, uh, it will be very efficient. It's based on the memory structure and uh, cache structure and uh, the GPU. So um, from the, the sampler, we can print the statistics. It would show you the keys, which is um, actually the, the maximum length uh, of each of the bucket. Um, and uh, we also show the counts of um, samples in each of the bucket. And all the batch sizes are the same. Um, so um, there's actually a bit more enhancement to the fixed bucket sampler, so if you're interested, you can try that out later. Um, see here in this uh, screenshot that uh, for um, the batches that have uh, uh, you know, lower lengths, uh, we actually increase the batch size, so each of the bucket is uh, wider. Um, this is to make sure that uh, the, the area of um, uh, each of the batch is about the same. So this has the effect of uh, being able to load balance the, the work. Um, so for GPU, you usually have a fixed memory size, and you want to make use of um, such resource as efficient as possible. So for shorter lengths, uh, since the computation is less, it would usually take less time. And uh, in order to fully utilize the, the capacity, you can increase the batch size dynamically. So we have functions in the bucket sampler to uh, do that as well. Um, so in the later part of the notebook, there's a link to the uh, data loading uh, tutorial. Um, in there, we described a bit more on how this can be implemented. Okay, so now that we have the, the bucket sampler, let's see what that uh, sampler is doing. Um, so from the, the sampler, we can create an iterator which would give me um, 
the, the batches, and the way that it tells me what samples to batch is to tell me what the indices are for, uh, for this data set. So here I get the iterator and then the first batches indices uh, by calling next on the iterator. And um, uh, with these indices, I can look up um, the, the tokens uh, from the, the training data set and get their lengths. So as we can see uh, from the, the lengths of uh, these samples, uh, they're actually uh, quite similar, and uh, minimum is 207, uh, maximum is 255, uh, and it has a lot lower variance. Okay, so now we got to exercise two. Um, so this is about uh, looking up the, the API doc for a uh, fixed bucket sampler and uh, play with it. Um, so I would like you to um, fill in the arguments for the fixed bucket sampler to uh, finish the, the data loading part. Um, and also uh, there's a link to the data loader. So that's where you can actually put uh, all these things together. Um, I think here by referring to the API doc, you will be able to put them together. Um, now I'm going to show that email address again in case anyone is uh, still not getting that uh, notebook instance. So one thing to note is that the bucket sampler is a type of batch sampler, and uh, when creating the data loader, you can just tell it to use the, the sampler that you created. It's supposed to be the batch sampler, not the regular sample sampler. We'll cover that uh, later in the tutorials too. So if you have any questions, just raise your hand, uh, the tutors will come to you. Has anyone got one version of the bucket sampler working? Yeah, okay.
So for those who just joined, uh, we are currently doing a, an exercise on the data pipeline. And uh, we're doing the, the exercises on a notebook instance that's backed by a GPU that we provide. Um, in order to get your own instance, you can write an email to the address on the, the slides. So here I just implemented the simplest uh, fixed bucket sampler, which is basically from what I showed before. Um, so you can use uh, an inline lambda function to, to get the length. It's uh, pretty much the same as the, the get length method that you've seen that I implemented before. It's just easier to write it here. Um, so uh, this would give you the fixed batch size, um, but if we want to uh, dynamically uh, scale the batch size, then uh, there's the bucket stream. So the reason that it's fixed is that uh, there's the constant width bucket. Um, on the other hand, uh, there are a couple of other strategies if you click on the bucketing schemes. So um, we can use the linear width bu bucket, which means um, the uh, batch size would uh, increase linearly uh, when the, uh, the length decreases. And there's also the exponential version. <coughs> so we can try this out. Here we are um, using this bucket scheme equals NLP dot data dot um, let's say the the linear width bucket. Okay. And we can print the stats again. Wait. There's also one more flag that I need to set. Oh yeah, so uh, there's the, the ratio that I need to set for this. 
Um, let's say we set the ratio to be 0 0.5. Yeah, now we can see that uh, for some of the samples, um, it's actually a lot shorter. Uh, it's 20, and the batch size is increased to 800. So this is how you can use the combination of these uh, uh, parameters to uh, achieve something like this, increase the, the batch size when the, the length decreases. Okay, and uh, uh, once you have the, the sampler and uh, uh, had some chance playing with it, uh, then it's quite easy to put everything together in the, the data loader. So for a data loader, uh, you just pass in the data set um, and uh, give it the, the batch sampler that you got from the, the bucketing strategy. Um, and also, data loader supports uh, multi-process uh, processing, so um, you can specify the number of processes here. Um, since it uh, involves uh, communication between processes, it needs to serialize, deserialize the data. So for simpler use cases, it might be easier to just use uh, zero uh, as the num workers. But for heavier process, um, the, the computation would take longer, and that would overcome the, the cost that's in serializing and deserializing. So that would be more uh, economic to use uh, multiple workers. So I'll just do the training data loader here. And wait. Okay, what did I do wrong? Train sampler. Okay, so I'll, I'll cheat a bit here and uh, just go to the answer that I had. Ah, okay, so I forgot to put in the batch file function, so that's why. Okay, so now it's able to print out the average lengths of uh, all the batches that I have. And we can actually get a sample out of this. So it's the uh, batch of indices along with the, the label. So this is the objective uh, of this notebook. Um, so in the, the next notebook, uh, we would be uh, trying to, to put everything together and do a sentiment analysis with the, the data pipeline that we just built as well as uh, the embeddings that we got. So. So the, the notebooks are designed to be uh, similar to what you would do when uh, doing research. You would be looking up the API docs as well as um, you know, trying to find the, the interfaces that suits your needs. So that's why the, the experience is created this way. Um, and for this notebook, um, we are going to cover the NLP modeling. Um, so in, uh, in here, we would cover two models. The first one is uh, continuous bag of words. Um, so what that means is basically that uh, uh, I want to represent the sentence by uh, taking the average of all the embeddings uh, of the, the tokens that I have in the sample. <coughs> and later on in uh, the, the exercise towards the end, uh, you would have the chance to enhance the model with uh, an, a bi-directional RSTM. 
uh, I assume that you already know what that is. So uh, with that, uh, you can actually see the performance improvement uh, from the architecture change. Um, and also uh, another important aspect here is um, to uh, show how you can put a training pipeline all together. So we covered how we can get the representation of the tokens and we also covered the uh, training data pipeline. Uh, now we need to show how we can um, say do bookkeeping of the, the metrics that we uh, are interested in, uh, how we can uh, evaluate the, the model, um, fit it onto a data set, and uh, um, sometimes uh, we might need to do early stopping. For example, if we know a model is uh, already converging, then there's, uh, well, training it further would actually overfit it on the, the training data set. So, all these functionalities are available now in uh, the new estimator API in, in Gluon. So uh, on the modeling side, uh, we would cover how to use the block and, uh, and also the concept of hybrid block uh, in Gluon. So um, the hybridization is uh, a really important concept in, in MX and Gluon. Um, it's a combination of uh, imperative programming and just-in-time compilation. Um, so the just-in-time compilation is a technique uh, where you can use uh, to improve the efficiency of uh, training and testing the model. So um, in the Gluon interface, we would actually dynamically switching uh, between the, the modes so that uh, we can benefit from the efficiency as well as still keeping the benefit of being able to examine everything that we just programmed. Um, and also uh, for simpler models uh, such as the continuous bag of words, there is a simplified API we can use to construct the model. We'll show what that is. Um, so on the training pipeline side, uh, we need to, uh, we, we will show how we can set up the loss and uh, the optimizer to use for optimizing the model uh, as well as uh, keeping uh, track of the metrics that we care about. Um, we would also show how, uh, you know, we abstract the multiple GPU concept in MXNet. So um, the, the instances that you got has one single GPU, so uh, you wouldn't be able to try this out, uh, but um, in terms of the interface, it's, it's actually quite easy to express that. You just need to pass on the, the flag for uh, multiple GPUs to the estimator and it would all be taken care of for you. Okay, so let's first import. Um, and also here, uh, I remember that um, when I was cheating, I looked at the utils file. So what that has is uh, basically the uh, data pipeline that we got from the second notebook, uh, you would have uh, your, your own version. So if you want to, you can try to tweak that file uh, and uh, make it into the version that you have, the utils.py. It's uh, in the same folder here. Um, now I'm loading the, the fast text embedding with uh, engram. So this is extra. This is not something that I covered in the, the first notebook. Um, so FastX is uh, uh, actually a technique for representing tokens based on the character engrams of uh, a word. So uh, let's say that uh, we want to get the embedding of presentation. Uh, we would uh, probably be able to find uh, a segment uh, of the word which is present uh, that appears elsewhere. So FastX explicitly models that into a separate uh, vector. And for all the character engrams that uh, FastX uh, has in its embedding, it will sum all of them together uh, to represent the, the word, uh, the whole word presentation. So uh, the engram here uh, is about loading the, the vectors of uh, such character engrams. Um, now we have uh, the um, continuous bag of words model. So it's a very simple model. Uh, we have uh, one layer of embedding and one death layer uh, for prediction. So since this is binary classification, I'm using uh, an output vector of two uh, and a softmax to represent the, the classes. 
Um, so um, in this block structure, um, there are two functions. One is the constructor, which is to declare uh, what layers this model would depend on. Uh, like I said, embedding and dense. Um, and in the forward, uh, we can describe how these things fit together. So we can call the self.embedding on the input indices to look up the embedding vectors. Um, and uh, we can do a mean pooling on uh, that, uh, uh, the, the sequence of the words so that we get the average vector of uh, all the words. Um, and finally, uh, on the encoded uh, vector, the, the averaged uh, vector uh, for the sentence, uh, we can use the, the dense layer to make the prediction and to produce the output. Um, so now moving on to more functionality on the uh, pre-training embedding. So uh, first we can get uh, the embedding size and dimension of the fast text. Uh, I think we actually had that before. So uh, in fast text, uh, it has uh, two, uh, well, uh, it's over two million uh, tokens in that vocabulary. And the, each of the, the vector has length 300. Um, on the other hand, in IMDB, uh, the vocabulary is uh, uh, almost 30,000. So uh, what I want to show here is the difference in the vocabulary. So how do you map uh, the indices that we generated from our IMDB vocabulary to the vectors in FastX? So uh, we have the built-in functionality for that. Once you create the, the embedding uh, through the embedding.create, you can pass it on to the vocabulary that we have. So by setting the embedding to the vocabulary, uh, the vocabulary would actually get an extra field called embedding. And this embedding is different from the original embedding in that the indices are shuffled according to the, the tokens. So now uh, we would get uh, the, the vectors from the fast text, but in the order that's specified by my own vocabulary. So this is about matching and shuffling the vocabulary. Um, so uh, remember that I talked about the multi-GPU training. Um, so in MXNet, uh, we express where we want to do the computation through the context, which is uh, something like this. Um, when I say MX.GPU0, it means I want to train on the uh, GPU with index 0. So uh, we can pass on the vocabulary length and the embedding size, which are the two parameters to uh, the previous uh, block that, that we had for uh, the continuous back of words, vocabulary size and embedding size. So this would construct the model. And once it's constructed, uh, you can pass the initializer to a specific layer. Um, here we want to initialize the embedding uh, with the pre-trained embedding that, I, that we got and shuffled. Um, so we just pass on uh, this index to vector matrix. So this is the shuffled embedding matrix that you can use as the weight for, for models. You can pass it on to the constant initializer, which is to tell uh, the model that this embedding layer should be initialized with this constant. Um, and uh, here I'm also doing a embedding weight uh, gradient request to be null. So this is telling the, the model that I don't want to adjust the weights of um, this layer. Um, so don't calculate the gradient for it. For the rest of the layer, which is really just a dense, um, so uh, we can do net to the initialize. It will give me a warning that uh, the, the embedding layer is already initialized, but it's expected. Okay, so uh, like I mentioned, uh, so a hybrid block and hybridization is an important concept in uh, uh, EMXNet Gluon. So the difference between a block and hybrid block is that uh, in the hybrid block, uh, the operations are limited to the operators that we have in EMXNet. So even though in this model we are all using the operators from MXNet, um, Sometimes you want to do fancier and uh, more custom kind of operation. For example, you want to use uh, uh, NumPy or Spacey in your, in your model. 
uh, in the block interfaces you would be able to. Um, but since these are functions that are external to MXNet, we wouldn't be able to keep track of uh, these operations for you. So we wouldn't be able to hybridize that. Um, so intentionally, we limit the operations of uh, hybrid block to all the functions that we have in MXNet. Uh, and uh, correspondingly, the, the uh, signature for the forward function would change to the hybrid forward, which has this similar place, uh, the, the extra placeholder of F here to represent all the operations that MXNet has. So, yeah, the rest are pretty much the same. It has the same constructor, so I can construct the network like this. Um, so, because the model is so simple, uh, we can actually stack all these layers together using the, the sequential API. So, uh, we can stack the, the embedding layer from the previous network uh, and also the decoder. Um, so, the hybrid lambda here is a lambda function. Um, that we use to express the mean pooling. Um, because in this uh, sequential API, it's about uh, calling the layers one by one and use the output of the last layer as input to the next one. So expressing that uh, mean pooling uh, that we did in the, the forward would need to be tweaked into such kind of format. So uh, we can pass in the, the function I, I think I refresh it. Um, so, yeah. So uh, we can pass in the main function like this and say that we want to take the main of uh, the output of last layer on axis one, which is the the sequence dimension, um, and that way we can do achieve the same main pooling like this. Um, so um, I think it's uh, time uh, for a coffee break. Uh, now that we have the model, the rest will be to put together the data pipeline and the model as well as uh, some training hyperparameters together into the estimator. So um, once we come back from the, the coffee break, we will move on to the estimator. It will be 15 minutes. Right, so uh, after that session, we would move on to the fancier and uh, more advanced recent progress on transformer-based uh, architectures. 